Welcome back, everybody, to this uh, little mini series on symbols and artificial intelligence here on Turtlecast. Um, it's, it was too much to put into one episode, so we wanted to uh, break this up so that it's a little bit more palatable here. Yeah, and I, I kind of want to start us off, uh, Alex, where we were continuing, but I want to get into understanding. Um, I, I think I want to go a little bit more macro, uh, understanding evolution and symbols. Mm-hmm. So if somebody's watching this for the very first time, um, this episode, and they didn't go to the last one. Wh- wh- whenever you look at as we as a species have evolved from the very beginning of lighting a fire or whatever it is, it's, I mean, we have symbols on caves. So symbols have been a part of us. And, and and I say that symbols evolve as we evolve. And and everything that we do every day, we're interacting with symbols. So it, it's almost, it, I don't want to say it's a separate language, but it's almost, it, but it is an integral part of humanity. Uh, you're um, you're onto something very strong here. So if we go back to the oldest cave paintings we find in France, there's no written language. It's strictly symbolically based. So I, I, th- I think the root of how we're looking at the symbols and artificial intelligence in this paper, which we'll talk about in a second, is that if we consider human evolution, we started with symbols first. And that symbol was representative of these acts that happened in life. Mm -hmm. So regardless of the person that came in the cave, it could be understood what was being said. But if you wrote it in a specific language, it'd be quite difficult for someone to come in and even figure out what that language might be, even if that language died. Yes. How do I, how do I actually, you know, bring that language back? We did an episode on that with MIT and bringing back these dead languages. But the fact here is that when I look at this transition is that the root actually of linguistics starts with symbols. Symbols are just a way that we have decided to um, turn into words so that we can communicate in a different format that is more audible. Because yes. I can't audibly like sound out a symbol. I mean, I suppose I could if I really wanted to think about my own sort of like, you know, alien language that I wanted to create. But the base of our evolution and our existence started with those symbols and how we interpret threats and other things. And like you said, as we begin to evolve, our interpretation of those symbols change also. And then we found efficiency in our communication by thinking that language was the thing that was best represented to pass off a thought or an idea Mm -hmm. or an understanding collectively of those thoughts or ideas. But what we find is that words themselves, even, uh, you know, the anglicized versions of many thoughts or ideas, uh, they lack a lot of value in actually explaining something's meaning. Well, you can even, I mean, even look at how beautiful and symbolic Japanese writing is. Yeah. I mean, it's almost, Con- sim- it's, it's like, it's like symbol, 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 symbol. And each of them stand in their own, even though it's an alphabet. They you know. stand on their own. Right. But c- together, you have something quite special that's actually happening. Mm-hmm. So it's part artwork, actually part linguistics. And now, when I think about going into an art museum, okay, you can tell me what this painting was about. You can write it down in text underneath it on a little plaque. And tell me who it was by and what year it was about that time. But I'm going to have my own interpretation, Mm -hmm. right, of a Monet, right, some sort of impressionist art, you know, or, you know, a Van Gogh or whatever it might be. And I'm going to say that this means and feels something different to me. Even though we all collectively understand that this is a piece of art, my interpretation of it is different. When I begin to communicate a message to you, Jason, the way you receive it is through your own interpretation. Right. Now, if we understand the value in that sort of sharing of knowledge in the evolution of human experience, it would make more sense that it would behoove us to actually do things that are always more representative of symbols rather than representative of the word itself to describe it. Yeah, and it, it's so easy. I mean, now uh, I mean, when you look at the global aspect of things, how many flags do we have? Flags, right? Yeah. And but you got to consider something about the flag. It's the medium of the flag. Mm-hmm. So all flags are essentially the same. It's a cotton linen blend, and it has color and image on it. So we understand that the structure and it being on a pole is symbolic. And then there's another representation of it: the fact that because it has a certain structure of colors, right, and where it's geographically placed is representative of something else. Yeah, I mean, you can look at Iwo Jima, perfect example yep. of graphically placed, you know. And then you can look at Braveheart and watch, you know, all the flags and the clan things, you know. Right. And, and all their, the their last and thing is to, as they're dying in battle, 
and giving up themselves for that. You know, they're looking at the flag. For that symbol. Right. But each one of those gentlemen that are dying, and I say gentlemen because, you know, at that time it was strictly men that were in battle. Um, the, each one of them had their own interpretation of how they felt about Scotland, how they felt about going to war and being at Iwo Jima. Right. That was very specific to each person. But, but, the, the, but the symbol, the, the symbol is what, I mean, you can look on the other, an Axis side, yeah. you know, with Germany, that symbol, I mean, that symbol, unfortunately they ruined the symbol because it was a the beautiful, swastika, yeah, it right? was a beautiful symbol from before. Yeah. So if which you, is, have you seen thing. all the, uh, all those symbols from the native Americans here in New Mexico? No, there's like three or four tribes that have them and have had dr- and drew them on rocks here. Oh, the petroglyphs. Yes, uh, that have that symbol on it, and it's it was done so long ago. Mm-hmm. You know, he just took it and then unfortunately ruined it. Yeah, and you know, and people do that. So then that that really drives down. That really begs the question: If I input a an algorithm into the machine learning for it to right. for it to root itself in. Am I destroying all future interpretation of what that symbol actually means? Well, it's it, it's ru- it's ruining the process for it to put a priority to li- like I mean, whenever they saw that symbol, how much did it bring everyone together? You know, in unity, mm-hmm. whatever symbol it may be that inspires people. Yeah. But you can put the the peace symbol in the which you know which we have a whole story with that. But the yeah. peace symbol in the sixties. In 70s, that brought peace, man, peace, love, you know, yeah. joy, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting. We, but, but you see what I'm saying? We we, we, we we build tribes and clans, and um, even to the point of us, like a machine would not understand this. Like, hey, this person's willing to die for a symbol? Like, you're willing to die for that? That doesn't make sense to me. But you said tribe and clan. Right. That's something that's not unifying. So then essentially the meaning of what that thing is collectively could not be truthful if it creates a separation of groups. Yes, yeah. It but, would but, have, but, the uh, meaning the would meaning, have to apply right. to everyone everywhere. That would truly define that in, would be unity, in an yeah, objective yeah, sense. Yeah, exactly. Something that is truly universal in symbols. But, you know, and you know this as I do, having polarity, it's it, people have a choice. When you're, when you're confronted with a symbol... Mm-hmm. You have to really say, "I like that. I don't like that. What is that?" But that's the subjective oh, I, part. Oh, I, I, my, you know, my uh, upbringing you're, and all of my past oh, is so you're coming being, you're together. You're being dogmatic towards it. Yes, would say, "Okay, yeah, that's beautiful, or that's ugly, yeah. or you know, what what is the what is the symbol associated with?" You see what I'm saying? Right. So that now you're taking the symbol, right, and you're creating another symbol. Of it. Mm, yes. So how am I linking that symbol to other things that actually yeah. sit outside of that symbol that really may not be representative of what that symbol means? When I think of a swastika, people's right. first thought is Nazis. Right. Right? But the real representation of it was something quite mathematical and unifying to a specific subset of a religious group in an area way away from Germany. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the question is then, if we look at that and we're designing symbols and we want to actually put that that idea of interpretation of symbol mm. into AI for its own learning and how to look at that symbol and say, oh, what does this mean? Then you would have to look at it strictly from a universal stance of cause and effect within that symbol itself. Mm. Yes, yeah. Line is line. Line is line must be accepted everywhere in the laws of physics, in the mind of a human being, everywhere. And it cannot be something that is subjective. It has to be something that stands on its own. And the creation of symbols can be a combination of things that stand on their own. So then the representation of the combination of these things, the sin plus the bowl, right, Right. then defines a full characteristic or linkage of standalone items in an objective sense that define a total picture of something outside of any subjectivity of human representation. So that whether a machine looking at it, spitting out an output says it's one thing, or a human looking at it, they both come to the same exact understanding. Then you've removed all bias out of that dogmatism and subjective referential experience that a human it's, being may have. And, and we're going to get in this article, but it's so tricky, dude. This would be, this is an undertaking. You know, I, I was thinking while you were talking about, I was, you said lines, you know. So we have a blue line. 
And we have this blue line thing, you know, with supporting cops. And then you have Black Lives Matters, which is, you know, a group that is trying to say, hey, there's racism and there's horrific things that are happening. So, but, you know, you put a Black Lives Matter symbol next to a blue line, you know, right now in 2020 and 2021, we see that as being something you know, that's polarizing. Well then, but, but, but that's changed it, with time, right? But, but yes, exa- that's what, that's where, so yeah. here's where you're going. So if time is changing and the interpretation of it is changing, yes. that means that it cannot altogether in the infinite body of time within our physical realm, mm-hmm. decide that as something truthful. The representation, the idea of it is not a truthful representation of what it is objectively. It is a subjective representation with changes with time. And if you do things strictly on subjective interpretations of it, yes. then you're moving further away from a truthful idea and an evolutionary stance of how to interpret a symbol. Well, and yeah, and you have to look, like you said, you have to look externally. If I'm at the airport and I walk in the door and there's two yellow lines on the concrete, mm-hmm. I'm automatically going to associate the lady at the desk with me being in the in the facility of an airport, mm-hmm. the location. And then I'm going to walk and go right in between those yellow lines, even subconsciously. So what have you done? I've taken this disparate point and this one over here and this one, and I brought yes. them all together to form an idea. And AI, how does it do that? AI yeah. is like, I, I can interpret languages, machine learning, that's easy. But now you're having me try to... <laughs> Look at a symbol and understand how to interpret the symbol. And my contention, and this is something that I think is essentially missed with this article. And again, we had to front load this whole thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. We haven't got an article yet, guys, which is an amazing article. Is that when we begin to speak and our language evolves, and as we continue to evolve, we have to make sure that we step on a platform that is truthful, a platform that is timeless, a platform that is truly rooted in some sort of universal law. And so when you look at symbols, something that is so incredibly important, you need to make sure that the design of that symbol is truly universal. That each piece that brings it together can stand alone and collectively can stand alone. And the reason I say that is because if we all have a subjective interpretation, then it moves us away from the logical linear path of our own evolution. And rather it drives us off into these areas where I'm going to interpret something one way and I'm going to be in my own specific group, and me on the other. And it creates well, we a, have that a, now. A, you know, and it creates that sort of disunification. And right. we cannot truly learn from one another because we don't stand on the same firm, rooted ground of understanding for what something actually means. Yes. And if we can remove all the bias out of something, then we can begin to understand one another. And if you interpret symbols as language, as if I begin to talk to you and you interpret those thoughts that I'm saying to some sort of visual picture in your mind then I would want to make sure that the words that I use are uni- they're unifying, words that are timeless, words that are truthful, and they're not really subjective. They are albeit objective because in the objective nature of it leads us towards something that is more truthful so that when we do act, we act in the best interest for all and the best interest for ourselves at the same time. But if I live in a world that's completely subjective, it separates groups and causes me to live in a world that is, I guess I would call it, service to self at that point. Yeah, when, when whenever you look at uh, this article, and uh, we can, you know, kind of broach it for a few minutes, and then um, we'll have to do another episode. Yeah. That's fun. It's called, uh, it's from DeepMind. It's called Symbolic Behavior and Artificial Intelligence. And um, this is what we've been saying, but th- I want I highlighted this because I want you to speak to this. A reinterpretation of what symbols are, how they come to exist, and how a system behaves when it uses them. And I want to stop right there. Um how a system behaves. That w- that's a key word, behaves. Yeah, behavior. Because behavior can be learned or programmed. Right. So when we're looking at behavior in AI, how do we continue to replicate something and then possibly learn from it? Then you're truly defining an artificial intelligence. But if you look at a symbol and you talk about behavior, is the AI really learning from the symbols? Because we would have to understand our own learning of them first. Yes. And this is this is really important here. So this paper doesn't come to a solve. Right. But it, it's more of a suggestion of a course of action interpreted off of history that we've had in the past. Here we go. <laughs> Bringing all these disparate points together to symbolically bring them into some formulated idea of what it means to move forward and how a machine should learn from symbols. So this paper is but a symbol of our idea of how we interpret symbols. Yeah, and I, and I like how they say that. 
uh, symbols as entities. Entities. Remember, an entity it has its own energy. It's something that needs to be able to stand alone, right? And an entity can do many different things, and we choose how much life we want to give to that entity, material or immaterial. And so that's the thing we're going to kind of dive into. And if you wouldn't mind just touching on what the title of the article is and the people that wrote it, and then we'll close out this episode, and then we'll start to get into the paper on the next one. Yeah, Symbolic Behavior and Artificial Intelligence, uh, Adam Santoro, mm -hmm. Andrew Lampinian, hopefully that's spelled that, Corey Mathewson, Timothy Lillicrop, and David Raposo. Rap Raposo? Yeah. Yeah. So I just, uh, before I close this out, shout out to these uh, thinkers. I think it's actually quite fantastic. Uh, we do a lot of uh, reviews on, you know, white papers and, you know, other things around data and uh, even articles. This was the most intellectually stimulating thing I've read in a long time. Yeah, that's pretty good. Symbolic behavior and artificial intelligence. You can look it up Thanks. by DeepMind. Thanks.